So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Yasso Aramugam, who is Assistant Director of Data and Digital at the National Archives of Australia. Um, Yasso, over to you for your presentation. Okay, so my name is Yasso Aramugam, and I'm the Assistant Director General for Data and Digital at the National Archives of Australia. I'm joining today's proceedings from Australia. I begin by paying my respects an acknowledgement to the traditional owners and custodians of the land. I joined the conference from Nambri and Nanawal lands and acknowledge their continuing connections to the land and community. I also pay my respects to the people, their cultures and elders past and present. So, before we begin, I'd like to share with you a bit of background about the National Archives of Australia. The National Archives of Australia was established in 1961 as the government agency that collects records of Australian government decisions and actions as evidence. We do, do this to connect Australians with the nation's memory, their identity and history. As illustrated on the slide, we carry out different functions in relation to information management, governance, and also identity, uh, identify government information for securing as an archival resource into the future. One of the key parts of our journey is the challenge we set ourselves a couple of years ago to be a world leading archive in this digital age. The vision was a major challenge to the way we had previously operated in Australia and set the course for the ambitious programs of work we have undertaken and continue with today as we digitally transform ourselves. In a sense, it is a step change to our capability. We are conscious that the solution is not just technical, we also need to address and develop capability for our people, and processes as well. To determine where to begin and what was needed, we considered our first principles. We mapped out the key elements we wanted to achieve, as illustrated on the slide, to use our North Star and provide a benchmark for measuring our progress. The key challenge we found was that our processes even those that were digital were based on traditional paper paradigms, which didn't necessarily leverage the benefits of new emerging technologies. We had to consider new methods and archival principles carefully. So, we encapsulated our strategic direction for change in our data and digital strategy. Innovation and emerging technologies provide context for this strategy as we introduce new capabilities to preserve our collection in perpetuity. Innovation is being driven by rapid advances in technology and necessitates that we transact digitally with our government partners and the public. Our vision will be achieved incrementally under our data and digital strategy, strategic direction by piecing together key building blocks over three horizons, which are strengthen our foundation, accelerate digitization and amplify the archives impact. So the technology goals we pursue under the, our strategy um, the outcomes are to, there are three here, uh, preserve and secure the National Archival Collection, put in place information and technology that underpin a world leading digital archive. And the last one is enable modern and customer focused information and technology services. As you have all probably experienced, the world's digital revolution does not stop and there are a number of challenges to digital transformation. Some of the key challenges we found on our journey are new, new technologies emerging. There's a horizon with new and emerging technologies that we must consider over time. 
increasing challenges in related areas such as cybersecurity. This is an increasing focus for us as we move and work increasingly online. The move to new and emerging platforms for organizations such as cloud requires changes to infrastructure and the establishment of strong foundations for the changes underway. Greater public engagement through a diverse range of digital channels, whereas in the past, the number of channels for engagement for end users was limited. Now it is quite extensive as we need to move to where users are. Exponential growth in digital information coming into our care. The Australian government is creating more and more data and information that will need to be retained to perpetuity. So in a sense, the challenges have created a perfect storm. We, have, we could have been caught in a loop of self-reflection and admiring the problem. With the emerging and new technologies, you could be stuck considering when to commence the change. Realizing this need for a shift in our culture has been to, essential to our learning. We needed to stop admiring the problem and instead start embracing the change. We could continue to consider challenges or begin working towards achieving our vision. Following a review of priority capability gaps, digital archival management or digital preservation was recognized as a critical need. A request for tender was made and the implementation of Preservica, a digital preservation solution was approved in 2020 to address the National Archives digital preservation needs. It was proposed to implement Preservica in line with an incremental plan. The goal was to realize incremental and progressive improvements to business capability and meet priority NA requirements, including digital transfer and ingest, ensuring um, metadata for archival control, uh, preservation of digital material according to best practice and staff access to digital records. Upgrades and technical uplift are key NA systems in progress to address additional capabilities required to deliver an end-to-end -end integrated archival management system. So one of the significant changes is focusing on delivering benefits for the organization incrementally, incrementally aligned to our long-term strategy. In our business cases, we identify the benefits to be realized through our implementation roadmap. Like the Wanderer butterfly pictured, it has been a metamorphosis of sorts, changing the emphasis from the doing to the delivery of benefits, a vital way for us to grow as an organization. Another key cultural change is shifting the patterns of how we execute our work. The NAA, National Archives Values Innovation, looking for new and better ways to do business and deliver digital services that are user-centered and embrace the future. This has relied on the use of agile and user-centered design methodologies to speed up process of delivering gradual change. This has resulted in quicker deployment and also the ability to pivot quickly to learn from when things have gone, not gone to plan. Co-design crucial to our success in delivering on our digital transformation and has been the business buy-in, in particular bringing our stakeholders into the process as equals to core design solutions to our challenges. This has helped improve our approach to different elements, including development of user stories through testing and user acceptance. While we have achieved our plans for implementation of digital preservation, we have not rested on our laurels. We have continued to incrementally and agilely change by selecting components of our integrated archival management system to address and improve. 
Two of the benefits we have discovered from this approach are the steady delivery of benefits and being able to pivot as necessary to new and emerging technologies. One area where we have delivered on is our new staff and discovery collection platform. Our co-design approach has been key to its success by meeting regularly with the working group comprised of key business stakeholders, we received regular feedback to guide implementation. This approach empowers the business to innovate as these stakeholders are helping shape the end product. We have brought the business with us by demonstrating the benefits to them. The solar engine offers superior search capabilities such as faceted search, full text search, ranked results in real-time indexing. Solar is used by many global websites and applications, including Instagram, Netflix, and eBay. This change and major advantages for our staff, including new search options, are all the search systems were not capable of. As I mentioned earlier, we have made great strides in the changing the culture, but there's more to do. As much as we would like to say our journey is complete, we acknowledge that the pace of change requires continuous improvement and delivery of ongoing transformation. A key message is that change is the constant and new normal. This can cause um, stress factors on people as it is not just in the workplace that change is happening. We're working on working to ensure change management is embedded into how we tackle the challenge of moving to where we need to be. Our culture has changed and we'll need to continue to change to meet the challenges of what comes next. Before I conclude, I would like to share a little on the public access front, which is an area we have not forgotten. We are currently exploring an enhanced public engagement experience using emerging technologies to provide a 3D rendering of our exhibitions. Digital Twin offers the public an immersive experience, including high resolution images of display items and talking head videos providing additional insights into the content. The creation of a digital twin brings our exhibitions to members of the public who cannot visit our national office or who want to share their experience with others. This is a way of amplifying visibility of our collection and providing new and exciting ways to access curated elements of our collection. That's, um, that concludes my presentation and happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yeso. That was fantastic. I liked one of your concluding points about the need for change being constant to meet our challenges. That was great. Um, we'll take questions shortly once we've had the other presentation. So if you could turn off your camera, that would be great. And I'll hand over to um, the next speakers. So our next speakers are Becca Mitten and Liz White from the British Library. Becca is the Single Digital Presence Project Officer and Liz is the Head of Public Libraries and Community Engagement. Um, and I'll pass over to you two now. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, thank you very much for coming along to our presentation. Um, uh, my name is Liz White, I'm a middle-aged white woman, I've got short brown hair and I'm wearing a blue shirt with orange flowers and uh, Dr Becca Mitten and I are going to talk to you about a project we've been working on for digital transformation of the public library sector and we're going to talk to you in particular about how we're trying to build in the professional ethics of the library sector into that digital transformation. We're based at the British Library, um, the UK's National Library, and um, our overarching mission is to make everyone's intellectual heritage accessible to everyone for research, inspiration and enjoyment. And this project fits into that in so many ways, not least in terms of making um, intellectual heritage accessible to everybody, because we know and value the work that public libraries do um, at community level. 
SILIP, um, the Professional Association um, for Library and Information Professionals, um, uh, has a guiding ethical framework, which is something that we've looked at and referenced throughout our work. It includes um, uh, references to equality, to public good, access to knowledge, intellectual freedom, impartiality, privacy and information literacy, all things that we want to be part of the work that we do as we try and translate what public libraries do into the virtual space. These are some key principles that we set out um, at the very start of the project. I think they're one of the first things that, that we wrote down when we first um, came on board with this. And again, these are about reflecting public library strengths and ethics. So we want our work and the transformation to be sector driven, co-created, informed by what the sector and what users think. Like libraries, we want um, the work to be trusted and authoritative. We want the digital interactions that you have to feel um, uh, as, as, as trusted as those that you have with library professionals. We want to promote physical visits and loans to libraries as well. This isn't about switching from physical to digital. It's about amplifying what goes on and advocating for libraries in the round. We want everything that we do here um, to promote the, the diversity, the inclusivity and accessibility of public libraries. We want to connect people and overall we want to deliver public and social value. We came on board in 2018. Um, the, the project has been around in the sector for a while before then, and the concept of a single digital presence had been identified um, in an independent review for um, DCMS. Um, but we were asked by Arts Council and Carnegie Trust UK to explore what this single digital presence for public libraries might look like on behalf of the wider public sector. Um, and the, our first output here, after a stage of um, research development, huge amounts of talking to users and non-users, was this report that we published in mid-2019. And again, you can see there that we were, even in the very beginning, we were trying to build something that would be predicated on the eth ethics and ethos of professional librarianship and try and harness um, that energy and, and those key principles. And um, these are some of the key development phases of our work. Um, after, after the research um, phase in-house, we embarked on, the, on two early phases, phases of digital product development, the discovery and alpha phase. And after a tender, we worked with a digital agency called DXW on this. And they helped us um, shape what users and non-users might want through extensive user research and testing and then also helped us build some prototypes to test those with users, non-users and the sector and to learn from those about what value we might want to add. We're currently in the beta phase working with two more agencies after tenders um, setting up the team and thinking about branding work to build a working version of the service, making it available to users and to scale this up. Um, and yes, we've been working with Public Digital and FCB Inferno who are helping us with the brand work here. To jump back to the discovery phase, this was really about exploring the hypothesis. So we were trying to see through conversation testing um, and, and co-creation, what should a national digital presence for public libraries look and feel like, and how would it uphold the principles and ethics that we've been thinking about from the off? We also wanted to think about user journeys. How would it help libraries engage with current library users where there are 151 different local authority library websites in England? And how do we attract new ones? How would we join all that up as an ecosystem and create um, um, a new sort of value added experience? We took that into the alpha phase where we then did some um, light touch prototyping and further user testing. So again, trying to think about how you could help people find out about their library and services. Very often non-users told us that they would love to use services. They didn't know they were there. They were surprised and delighted by what was there. We wanted to know how to make it easier for people to access library services, both physical and digital. And again, we wanted to demonstrate how some kind of national platform could allow local libraries and their national partners to showcase um, their online offers to a wider audience, knowing that public libraries have a really great re reach into communities and also have some of the most diverse users of, of any kind of art or um, glam form. Um, this, we're kind of thinking about this approach in an inclusive and agile way. Um, and this, uh, this map is just to show you how iterative it was. Lots of thinking, testing, engagement all the way through as we start moving, moving through all of these phases. 
And at the end of um, the discovery and agile phase, we came up with a value proposition, again, having ethics at its heart. And this was all about trying to harness um, what we wanted the digital transformation to do and what we wanted to bring what we wanted to bring to life. So we really wanted to build that community of library um, lovers online and to forge that common identity, utilising the expertise and values of librarians and librarianship. We were thinking about place too and how this could help grow strong and place based communities, just like public libraries do on high streets around the UK. Obviously, as something in the glam sector, we wanted to improve access to and knowledge of public library and other collections. We wanted to make it easier and more intuitive to move from your local library through to other bits of that national library ecosystem. And also in terms of knowledge, we wanted to bring um, the role of librarians and other information professionals with us on the journey. And again, make sure that this was another way in which they could connect with the public. And all of this obviously has ethics at its heart. I'm going to hand over to Becca now, who will talk you through um, uh, to where we are now. Thank you, Liz, and hello, everyone. Um, <coughs> I'm, a, I'm Becca Misson, and I'm a, a, a white woman in my late 20s um, with sort of reddish brown hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a white top. Um, yeah, so I'll kind of talk about where we are now, what we're developing, and the kind of values that are underpinning that. So... As Liz mentioned, we're in the beta phase, which is funded by Arts Council England, um, and it's split into two two strands. Um, through the discovery and alpha phases, we found that rather than creating one single national digital presence, um, it would be better to make a new national platform as well as to improve local library sites that already exist through a grant scheme. Um, so yeah, those are the two strands of the, of the work, but we want to make sure that they're part of an ecosystem and, and they're kind of seamlessly linked together. Next slide, thank you. Um, so yeah, a bit more on the national platform. So the platform will amplify and celebrate what libraries are doing, but it will also connect users through to their local in-person and online services. So it will share content curated and created by librarians, things like book recommendations um, and other items of interest, um, such as like positive news stories from local libraries around the UK, because we know that a lot of the time there's such great things happening, but they just don't have the platform to be shared and people aren't aware of them. Um, but yeah, it will also connect through to those local transactional services, um, like searching catalogues, reserving books and so on. Um, and we'll be taking a convening role here. So as we have been through, um, throughout already, we'll continue to work with the library sector throughout on kind of every aspect of this. So the kind of outcomes, um, the national platform will provide inspiring up to state content um, generated on books, reading, culture and society, again, with the voice of the librarian, the trusted voice of the librarian at its heart. Um, a key component will be searchable local, national on, and online event listings, because we know at the moment it can be quite hard to find out what's what's happening in your local library. Um, so we'd like to make it so that people can yeah, easily, easily get through to those local events, but also see what kind of national and online events are happening of interest to them. Um, but with a related a relation to libraries, um, providing a focus for national campaigns and advocacy. So we've had, had lots of conversations with library staff recently, particularly this is always part of it, but it's really been driven home recently how important this aspect of the platform will be. Um, there's a real desire for a kind of um unified national voice for, for public libraries so that we can kind of collectively talk about all the great things that they do and get more people through the door. Um, so, and then the, the final thing on here is the partners will be able to share content with public library users at scale through a homogenous system, but local libraries will retain their autonomy and identity. So again, it's about the kind of um, coexistence of the, of the national umbrella presence, but with that kind of localized improved presence um, underpinning it and enabling people to share their locally distinctive um, content and resources with that wider audience. So in all of this that we've mentioned, um, it'll be underpinned by privacy and data conscious principles. Um, the graphic on the left was posted by Albany Public Library in America at the time, I think in December last year, when Spotify shared its yearly wrapped roundup of users' listening habits. So their statement, um, we don't keep track of what you read, watch or listen to, because privacy should be the default, not the exception, really reflects our own approach to this project and anything that we're developing. 
And um, secondly, trust is a really important part of this. So um, a fairly recent Ipsos Mori poll um, from late last year found that librarians are the second most trusted profession, second only to nurses by 1%. Um, and the online offer that we're developing will really reflect, celebrate and draw on that trusted role of the librarian, um, particularly in a kind of time of fake news, which is particularly pervasive on social media. Um, we think that libraries and their trusted staff can help people to discover with confidence. So we want this new national platform to be a space um, where libraries can kind of share content and engage with users in a space with library values and ethics at its heart where, yeah, that kind of trusted um, discovery is really kind of core to the whole thing. And they know that this is a this is like a space that reflects what the physical library space is like and is, um, yeah, sort of neutral, trusted, welcoming, accessible, and so on. And I think, yeah, to kind of to, to end, I think that's a really important point that the physical library space is ac accessible and welcoming for everyone. And we want that to be reflected in an online space, which often more broadly on the internet doesn't necessarily feel like that. Um, libraries have a huge number of users, uh, pre-lockdown figures put it, um, more than Premier League football games, the cinema and the top 10 UK um, tourist attractions combined. They have more users than all of those. Um, and they're consistently found to have more diverse audiences than other cultural spaces, as Liz mentioned. So, yeah, we want this online space to really reflect and honour that. Um, and in practice, that means things like committing to accessibility standards so everyone can use the platform. It will have an informal and accessible tone of voice and will take account of things like information literacy and digital exclusion, which was mentioned at the beginning. Um, yeah, so I think that's all from us. Thank you very much for listening. Um, there's our email address there if you want to get in touch um, about any of this. We'd be very happy to speak to anyone. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, yeah, I absolutely love my local library, so I'm really pleased to hear about that it might have a, a bigger digital presence. Um, OK, we've got time for a QA and a now. Um, if you do have any questions, please post them in the Q&A and uh, I can pick those up. Or if you have any comments, please put them in the chat. Um, if all the speakers could put their camera on and have their mics on as well, that would be perfect. Um, and yeah, I think I might start with a question for Yasso, if that's okay. Um, so my question was um, around maybe the involvement of staff in um, kind of trying to fulfil your digital mission. Um, was it the case that you had to recruit um, staff doing new kinds of roles um, to fulfil this strategy and this mission? And did you have any challenges finding your staff? Um, yes, yeah, so it was a, it was twofold. What we wanted to make sure was um, the staff we had also had an opportunity to participate in the change. Um, so we worked with them first. We identified a few um, change advocates, if we call them such, um, and took them on the journey on what agile and iterative development looks like, and. Generally, staff are passionate about an agency. They they all want this good intent, you know, um, but it's it's getting over that silo thinking and looking at the need to transform into a digital agency and what that looks like. So before we uh, went out and recruited staff, because we thought that might come across as a bit of a negative change, we actually took, um, we looked at staff who were, who were quite passionate. They were actually passionate about even the current processes, but we took them and formed a small core group and then showed them the shortcomings, um, talked them through how we were going to you know, solve it. And then um, we called them the change advocates and that really worked. And then that grew into a design reference group. And then from there, it was still still hard, but to answer your question, we didn't just go out and bring new people in and ask them to lead the transformation. It was actually, in the end, the people we had were um, kind of uh, the people who transformed. I, I possibly was the only new one in there. I had just come into the agency. Thank Thanks. you. That's great. Um, we've got um, a question now for um, Liz and Becca. 
Um, so how are you proposing to handle AV content within the single digital presence? Is there a special unit looking at how to make this accessible through screens within physical libraries? Liz or Becca can I ask one of you to answer that one. Yes, sorry, could you just say the second half of that again about physical screen, physical? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'll say the whole thing again. So how are you proposing to handle audiovisual content within the single digital presence? Is there a special unit looking at how to make audiovisual content accessible through screens within physical libraries? Yes, one of the um, one of the projects that we're also um, working on in my um, area of the BL at the moment is called the Living Knowledge Network, where actually for a few years now we've been um, running <coughs> excuse me, live screenings from the British Library um, in London out to public libraries across the UK and also increasingly from other public libraries to other public libraries um, through both um, uh, uh, physical screenings um, in libraries and um, an online platform that we put up um, uh, in June 2020 during the pandemic. So we're, we're drawing on the experience of that um, as we develop um, the single digital presence as well and you know we will we will put our content um, across there and make sure that the you know, users can click through and find all of that. All of the screenings that we've been doing um, since uh, 2020 are on, um, on a platform called livingknowledgenetwork.co.uk. I can put the link in the chat. So yes, we've learned a lot from that. We're learning about um, obviously using the analytics from that to understand how and when and what sort of content people like to look at, how to help libraries market that. And again, how we can use social media to, to understand um, what people would like to see, which then actually goes back into informing the BL's own programming. Brilliant, thank you, Liz. Um, we've got another question here for you both. Um, so it's a question about your four element wheel model. Um, and the questioner was wondering how place features in the digital offer. It is generally often considered that the digital is not place bound, but why have you opted to take that as one of the central cornerstones as opposed to, for instance, community? If you could describe how you claim to the four elements of the core values, um, the questioner would be interested to know that. So yeah, could you speak a bit more about those four elements? Yes, of course. I mean, actually, community is one of the things in the um, description underneath the place segment. So actually, to describe that in full, it talks about growing strong place-based communities, using digital to grow communities and to community action, helping users utilise the events already happening in libraries and placing library at the heart of community. So. We, you know, we, we use places as a kind of proxy there to unpack different types of community. I mean, again, I think what that's getting at really is that, as Becca said, there's two layers to this. With all of the user research that we've done and all of the testing of prototypes, it's, the, it's that two layer concept that, that really resonated with people. Um, there's a national presence certainly to help draw people through, but there's also um, the local web presences as well. And so again, the key is about those user journeys between them. It's not it's not one or the other. There's no national system that will completely replace what goes on in terms of local public library uh, websites. People are still saying, whether it's staff, users or non-users, are still saying, you know, there's a place and a need for those because people want to know how to go and visit them. But actually there's something that can, can smooth that, that user journey. I would just add to that as well, that whilst this is a digital project, it's very much tied to the physical space of the public library and the overall aim, if we know we've been successful, is whether more people are going into public libraries. So I think that, yeah, it partly kind of reflects that, that we're not creating something that takes away at all from the physical engaged space, um, but that kind of supports people to access it. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Liz. Um, I've got another question for Yasso. Um, it's maybe about the response of your audiences to your kind of digital strategy and role. Um, do you have any research or knowledge about what your reputation is like with kind of the wider public for being um, a digital archive and maybe researchers who might want to work with born digital content? Um, so that's still uh, a learning journey for us. Um, we've got some analytics and we're getting better at, you know, collecting um, stats from like web platforms. Um, yeah, so I can't, um, 
I can't give you a fulsome answer, but what we're working on is um, there are more than researchers that we want to reach. You know, we're good at that, I think, where researchers were used to coming into our research centers and looking. But I think our collection um, has value to all Australians and might be internationally as well. So how do we get, you know, how do we get our collection to be used in schools, in universities, and then just, you know, everyday Australians as well. And I think um, our 3D platform is one that we take a lot of pride in, that digital twin of one of our, um, it's, an, it's an exhibition called Voices. So if you go to na.gov.au and look at uh, the Voices exhibition, and you can either take a, a 2D tour, if you've got the Google Oculus glasses, put them on, you can actually walk the exhibition and it is about our constitution. And there's some great things in there and the talking heads that we've introduced. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that would we'll reach, you know, the Gen Ys, the Xs and the Zs. And uh, that's the fulsome experience we want to take um, forward. Now, obviously, how do we get better at uh, collecting feedback on that and then measuring ourselves is a continuing journey. So we've got like Google Analytics that gives us some type of measurement. But um, to answer your question, Louise, we still, um, that's a learning journey on how do we improve feedback, more fulsome feedback, and then how do we adjust and how do we agilely change things as well. Thank, Thank you, Yato. Sounds like you're on the right journey. Um, I have another question come in for Liz and Becca now. Um, so um, I'll read it out. So DCDC has been talking a lot about how Glam staff are active curators of content. And you mentioned public libraries being seen as a neutral space, which was really interesting. The question was wondering how or if you were planning to incorporate any aspects of these discussions about curatorship and innate bias into the single digital presence. Yes, thank you. It's a really important question. Um, when we, when the British Library published its um, uh, living knowledge uh, vision document, which um, runs through to 2023, one of the things we talked about there was that when we thought about libraries, we thought of them um, as, a, as a combination of the collections, the spaces, whether they're physical or digital, and also the people within them, so users and also staff and, and other professionals. And so you're completely right that your collections, the choices that are made by those, the choices that are made in terms of um, uh, curation, obviously have some kind of element within them um, and will, will include um, different kinds of biases that need to be countered. So uh, I think that was mainly in reference to the actual physical spaces that people feel comfortable and confident going into public libraries. They feel like spaces that are, are non-commercial and non-judgmental. Um, but yes, absolutely, the, um, you know, they need to be very careful, um, careful thinking about the, um, uh, the, the curation of any content. We're doing some um, recruitment at the moment um, for content strategists. Another key aspect of this, and again, going back to those key principles from SILIP and the professional body, um, is around um, uh, data literacy, algorithmic literacy as well. And again, in, in terms of how that information is brought to bear and the decisions that are made about that. So yes, it's a, it, it's a really important question. Becca, did you have anything to add? Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question for um, Liz and Becca, if that's okay. Um, I'm interested in um, the kind of user studies that you did to find out information about people that might be using this, this single digital presence. I wondered if you found any kind of variations on um, current provision and responses to it and how people experience libraries on a geographical scale, like for example, is it different in London compared to elsewhere or, or any other variations across on a national basis? Yes, um, 
Uh, is, the short, is the short answer yes it does vary it varies in terms of um uh, what's available on your local authority website. It also varies in terms of um, different um, different demographics of, pe of people that, that are using them. So yes, there's lots of variation. It's kind of um, the experiences are as rich as um, as library services themselves. Um, I can put a link in the chat to um, uh, uh, some of the blogs that we've done um, about those earlier phases if people are interested in, in having a read about what we did. Um, and just to follow up on that point um, about user response, um, I found your point interesting about the, the data privacy, and that's obviously a very important thing to embed in the project. I wondered if you found that that came up at all in responses from the public as an issue or whether it was something that they kind of had lower awareness of. We know that the the values of libraries and, and actually, Becca showed the Murray poll at the end, but it's one of the things that people really love and respect about libraries, that they're um, a place where you can go and you can read anything, you can have access to anything. Um, and so it, it's something that people often use different terminology, but it is something that, that came through. And also we know from the experience of talking to um, library library staff and other professional staff is that, again, they want anything that's online, they want to hold they wanted to hold those core values they wanted you know we talk a lot about um uh you, you know w when you use search engines and things people know now that there's an element of, of kind of what the algorithms are doing and there's a you know there's growing awareness of the need for algorithmic literacy about how how different search functions might um raise something up um not just based on uh, on relevance and so yeah all of those things are are coming through as part of it and um, both in terms of the, the the sort of the data and algorithmic literacy but also in terms of yeah privacy in terms of patron data people really value that about public libraries and so they want to know that um anything happening in the digital space is going to uphold that you know those same values yeah, um, kind of an interesting thing that came out of um, lockdown, actually, there were some reports within the sector about how libraries um, adapted to, to lockdown, not having the physical spaces and how they tried to engage with users digitally. And a problem that some of them came up with, um, came up against, sorry, was that um, so that the websites on the council web pages on the gov.uk domain, often it was difficult for them to keep those updated and have them as a kind of engaging thing beyond the very simple, like, opening times and that sort of stuff. Um, so they wanted to use social media as that, because that would be an easy space where they could be in control. But some of them expressed that, some librarians expressed that they felt uneasy about pointing some of their traditional users who they might have spoke to over the phone during lockdown to say like, oh, if you want to see our content, then make a Facebook account if they didn't already have one, because they felt uneasy about pointing people towards these spaces that were um, profit driven, that were, using their data that was advertising to them and so on. So hopefully this could be a kind of antidote to that because there will be a space where you can access that more experiential um, light sense of the library and um, all the things it offers in a space that isn't doing that and that is, um, yeah, isn't, isn't after your data, isn't trying to sell you things and so on. Thank you, um, sounds great. Um, yeah, so I have another question for you, if that's okay. In your presentation, you talked a bit about how um, you've been working with agile methodologies, um, and I'm sure there'll be some people on the call who are not familiar about how they work in practice. So I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that and maybe some of the key benefits that you found working in an agile way. Yeah. Um, thanks, Louise. So, um, Key part to Agile is actually uh, a good end-to-end -end picture of what we're setting to achieve. So sometimes people think Agile means no planning. You just come in and think what you want to do today and do it. Actually, um, with Agile, you need to have a strategy and a high-level goals of that, a goal of what you want to achieve. And then using, combining that with an iterative um, delivery model, allows you to then break that into, uh, you can call them phases, you can call them milestones, you can call them tranches. Um, but uh, I'm sure Becca, Becca and um, Liz said it as well, but you can use proof of concepts, you can use pilots, 
um, and, and testing phases. So it's it's like a loop where you go from um, high level requirements detail, but they're smaller smaller circles, a pilot, and then going into production, and then using that lessons learned to continuously iterate and develop. And being agile is about um, going through that cycle, using stand-ups. Um, and we had to, you know, we had COVID in, in the mix. So we had to move from where people had physical Kanban boards. They were standing around and, you know, putting the, uh, they, we had avatars for people where they would have the stickers up on things they had to do. And they had to move to Planner on M365. So we had equal um, um, tools that were on cloud that people could use and still were, have that concept of a stand-up meeting every day and using the plan on M365 to allocate tasks and move agilely was a big shift where um, it wasn't a year, year of planning, um, planning implementation and delivery to see the outcome, but it was about a three month cycle on, you know, seeing something, realizing the benefits and then going into the next phase. This, um, it was good. And what we needed to make sure was there wasn't change fatigue because sometimes when people are really busy and they don't want to test because one of the risks that people um, saw was when they tested, they thought that would be the end of what they would get. So, you know, taking them on the journey and saying that was the beginning of what they were getting. And yeah, by signing off on, you know, requirements and test acceptance more agilely, they're actually on the journey and they're actually um, helping to shape uh, what we will, uh, what they will realize in the end. So lots of lessons. It was quite new for our um, agency. I've used it before. So I was, I was quite confident on, um, it's actually going to work, but I had a lot of people around me who were uh, quite skeptical at the beginning, but uh, it was it was a positive experience um, where we've come to. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, that sounds good that you overcome the challenges. And yeah, that's the benefit of Agile, that you can find out what's going well and what's going wrong relatively quickly and adjust and change as you go rather than finding out closer to the end. Um, I'll bring things to a close shortly, but I'll end with one last question for Rebecca and Liz. Um, I wanted to ask about um, kind of the position of local libraries who might um, be limited in funding um, and not have many staff as well. I wondered if you thought about how, how those issues would um, affect ability to interact and put content on a single digital presence. Yes. So um, one of the things we're doing at the moment is building up um, a central team that can support. So um, we're recruiting at the moment actually for um, a content role for someone to develop content that can be shared, who can also help amplify content that's created locally. Um, there's a grant come, a grant fund that's coming with this phase of the work. So there's a um, just over a million pounds from Arts Council as part of this um, that's ring fenced for, for local libraries to help them. So we'll be uh, opening up a, a grant scheme um, uh, over the over the next few months um, designed very much we hope with the sector um, uh, to help pilot um, uh, with, with a number of local authorities about what works for them and then we can take that learning back into thinking about um, longer term sustainability but it's a really good question. Yeah and just on that as well so as well as giving out money we're going to be um, kind of trying to develop a community of practice around the grants and creating kind of resources and um, toolkits about best practice that even those who aren't in receipt of a grant will be able to, to benefit from. So hopefully we'll be able to kind of reduce the load across the board by providing that kind of, um, yeah, support um, pattern libraries and so on. Thank you. 